Hello and welcome to Navara Live. I'm Moylozy McLean. We have an absolutely jam-packed show for you tonight. And to help take me through it, I'll be joined by political economist Kieran Andrew. Moya, good to, hear, uh, good to be here with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear me and it's good to be here with me. Coming up later tonight, we'll be speaking to a surgeon who has just returned from Gaza. We'll also have more on the postmaster scandal with the post office inquiry starting today. Stay tuned for all of that. But first, we'll be looking at South Africa's case at the International Court of Justice, where they are charging Israel with genocide in Gaza. The International Court of Justice has heard the first day of South Africa's legal case against Israel. South Africa is accusing Israel of committing genocidal acts in Gaza and breaking the genocidal prevention clauses in the 1949 Geneva Conventions. As United Nations members, Israel and South Africa are both signed up to the conventions. And the ICJ is the UN court which decides issues between member states. South Africa has sent a team of eight lawyers to The Hague to present their case. And they've been careful throughout to remind the court that at this stage, this isn't being asked to judge whether Israel is in fact committing genocide, rather South Africa only needs to show that there are reasonable grounds to believe that genocide may be being committed by Israel. And if so, the court can issue an emergency order to stop the bombardment in Gaza while the case moves to its next stage. That could take many years, hence why these emergency stages are in place. The country's justice minister, Roland Lamola, opened South Africa's arguments at The Hague. The violence and the destruction in Palestine and Israel did not begin on the 7th of October 2023. The Palestinians have experienced systematic oppression and violence for the last 76 years. On 6 October 2023 and every day since October the 7th, 2023. In the Gaza Strip, at least since 2004, Israel continues to exercise control over the airspace, territorial waters, land crossing, water, electricity, and civilian infrastructure, as well as over key government functions. No armed attack on a state territory, no matter how serious, even an attack involving atrocity crimes, can provide any justification for or defense to breaches to the convention, whether as a matter of law or morality. Now, part of South Africa's case is based on what Israel has already done and whether those acts potentially fall under the Convention on Genocide. To that end, lawyer Adila Hassim put forward this litany of Israel's atrocities. Palestinians in Gaza are subjected to relentless bombing wherever they go. They are killed in their homes in places where they seek shelter, in hospitals, in schools, in mosques, in churches, and as they try to find food and water for their families. They have been killed if they failed to evacuate. In the places to which they have fled, and even while they attempted to flee along Israeli declared safe routes. The level of killing is so extensive that those whose bodies are found are buried in mass graves, often unidentified. In the first three weeks alone, following 7 October, Israel deployed 6,000 bombs per week. At least 200 times it has deployed 2,000 pound bombs in southern areas of Palestine designated as safe. These bombs have also decimated the north, including refugee camps. 2,000 pound bombs are some of the biggest and most destructive bombs available. They are dropped by lethal fighter jets that are used to strike targets on the ground by one of the world's most resourced armies. Israel has killed an unparalleled and unprecedented number of civilians with the full knowledge of how many civilian lives each bomb will take. 
Now, it could be argued that despite dropping all those bombs on civilians, Israel doesn't intend to commit genocide against the Palestinians because genocide is more than a mass killing. A state that commits it has to have the intention to destroy an entire group of people. That was the case that Tembeka Nungai Tobi set out to prove. Prime Minister Netanyahu, in his address to the Israeli forces on 28 October 2023, preparing for the invasion of Gaza, urged the soldiers to remember what Amalek has done to you. This refers to the biblical command by God to Saul for the retaliatory destruction of an entire group of people known as the Amalekites, put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. The deputy speaker of the Knesset, Israel's parliament, has called for the erasure of the Gaza Strip from the face of the earth. The Defense Force agrees. On 9 October, the Defense Minister, Yoav Gallant, gave a situation update to the army, where he said that as Israel was imposing a complete siege on Gaza, there would be no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel. Everything would be closed because Israel is fighting human animals. <coughs> Speaking to troops on the Gaza border, he instructed them that he has released all the restraints and that Gaza won't return to what it was before. We will eliminate everything. We will reach all places. Eliminate everything, reach all places without any restraints. A third part of South Africa's case concerned the question of risk. If Israel is allowed to continue bombing and starving Gaza, is there a risk that a genocide would take place? Irish lawyer Bline Negrali argued that there is. On the basis of the current figures, on average, 247 Palestinians are being killed and are at risk of being killed each day, many of them literally blown to pieces. They include 48 mothers each day, two every hour, and over 117 children each day, leading UNICEF to call Israel's actions a war on children. On current rates which show no sign of abating, each day, over three medics, two teachers, more than one United Nations employee, and more than one journalist will be killed, many while at work or in what appear to be targeted attacks on their family homes or where they are sheltering. The risk of famine will increase each day. Each day, an average of 629 people will be wounded some multiple times over, as they move from place to place, desperately seeking sanctuary. Each day, over 10 Palestinian children will have one or both legs amputated, many without anaesthetic. Each day, on current rates, an average of 3,900 Palestinian homes will be damaged or destroyed. More mass graves will be dug, more cemeteries will be bulldozed and bombed and corpses violently exhumed, denying even the dead any dignity or peace. Each day, ambulances, hospitals and medics will continue to be attacked and killed. The first responders who have spent three months without international assistance, trying to dig families out of the rubble with their bare hands, will continue to be targeted. On current figures, one will be killed almost every second day, sometimes in attacks launched against those attending the scene to rescue the wounded. Each day, yet more desperate people will be forced to relocate from where they are sheltering or will be bombed in places where they have been told to evacuate to. Entire multi-generational families will be obliterated and yet more Palestinian children will become WC, 
NSF, Wounded Child, No Surviving Family, the terrible new acronym born out of Israel's genocidal assault on the Palestinian population in Gaza. Now, the court has adjourned until tomorrow when it will hear Israel's response to South Africa's charges. But Israel's foreign affairs spokesperson has already tried to trash South Africa's arguments in the public sphere. Posting on Twitter, Lior Hayat called the case, quote, one of the greatest shows of hypocrisy in history and described South Africa as, quote, the legal arm of the Hamas terrorist organization. Speaking outside the ICJ, South Africa's Justice Minister, Roland Lamola, gave this response to those claims. Do you get enough political support from other countries? I commented that you, at South Africa is the legal arm of Hamas. How do you respond to that? Yeah, we, we have presented a case here um, uh, on behalf um, of the government of the Republic of South Africa. And we are doing so on behalf of a number of Palestinians, young kids, women, and the elderly that are being um, killed in, um, in, um, in, in Gaza. It is, it, we are not presenting any case on behalf of Hamas. So that statement is baseless. That statement has got no merit. We, we do not have any mandate from, from Hamas. Our mandate is from the South African government. And um, our case also is not against the Jews as a people. Our case is against the actions of the state of Israel, the actions of genocide that are committed in Gaza. Now, the question on everybody's lips is, what significance does this case actually have? So earlier today, I spoke to the UK director of Human Rights Watch, Yasmin Ahmed, about what precedent this case could actually set. This is incredibly significant. Uh, What we've seen to date is largely a paralysis by the international community in terms of responding to the gravity of abuses that we've seen being carried out in Gaza by Israel over the last three months. And the fact now that the highest court in the world, the preeminent judicial body of the United Nations, is hearing a case which is being heard by a state such as, but we sorry, which uh, which is being brought by a, a state such as South Africa about the atrocities, and in fact, specifically calling on the court to decide whether the acts that Israel has carried out a genocide is genocide is very very significant. Is there precedent for cases of genocidal intent being heard at? the International Court of Justice, and what could we learn about the direction of this case from those? I think there's two things. One is that the court has heard cases previously which concern the Genocide Convention and whether a state has in fact breached their obligations, and we we know that in relation to Bosnia and Serbia, where Serbia was found to have failed to prevent genocide. Um, But we also know that there are currently cases before the court which concern the Genocide Convention, uh, namely in relation to Myanmar and in relation to Russia. And we know that the court has not been afraid to issue provisional measures. And that's what the hearing today was about. It was about whether the court will issue measures and ensure that there are steps that are taken now before the full case can be heard that would in fact protect individuals from crimes listed under the Genocide Convention and to ensure, for example, that uh, documentation and other evidence is preserved so there can be accountability and justice in the longer term. If the court does rule in favour of South Africa and decides on interim measures, is that binding in any material way on Israel's part? So it is certainly binding. It's um, a binding order of a court and Israel would be required to comply with that. And the fact that Israel is a party to the proceedings and is actively engaging in the proceedings um, really does bolster the fact that it will be required to, and in any event it would be, to comply with any of the rulings of the court. And what we're saying as Human Rights Watch is that uh, any ruling that is um, imposed by the court must be complied with by Israel. And we're also urging the court to consider uh, imposing um, a requirement that Israel, in fact, uh, 
provides reports to the court which are publicly available as to how they are in fact complying with any measures that the court does provide. I think what's really important at this moment is there is a, as much transparency as possible with respect to how any measures that are imposed by the court are in fact implemented by Israel. And it will be very important, not only for the longer term decision of the court, but very importantly for the protection of Palestinians in Gaza. To be frank, Israel is a country with a record of huge amounts of human rights violations, uh, even while it says, you know, we're not breaking humanitarian law, we're not an apartheid state. Many human rights organisations say completely different. How can we rely on Israel to actually comply with this and in the event provide reports saying they're complying with this that are actually truthful or accurate? We do know that there is a very real possibility uh, that Israel may not comply with any measures that are imposed by the court. Um, And we know this um, because there have been other states uh, who have had measures imposed on them and they have not complied. And we know, as you have noted, that Israel has consistently and persistently uh, violated international law, both in this current context and in previous context. But what is very important is that it's not just an order of the court. It will be an order that will be sent to the Security Council. We know that the Security Council is deadlocked in in respect of this issue, but it will also be incumbent upon states themselves to impose measures on Israel, whether that's sanctions or other measures, to push Israel to comply with the measure of the court. And we should also be pushing other international organs such as the UN General Assembly and other organs to also do that. So whilst there is no silver bullet here in terms of compliance with a court order, there are ways that states and international bodies can push Israel to comply. And I think really importantly, those people who say that that is a reason why this case should not go forward fail to uh, appreciate the importance of these issues being adjudicated by an international court. The fact that there is a spotlight on these issues and an independent international court that will assess these claims on the basis of evidence and arguments made by the states is very important both now and for the future. So just to clarify, if this ruling is in favour of South Africa, there will be a duty on member states like the US, like Britain, to take action based upon the provisional ruling that Israel may be committing genocidal acts and that case will be further heard about that? There's a requirement for states uh, such as the United States and the UK and other states around the world to ensure that Israel complies with any provisional measures that are issued by the court. And if they fail to do so, that these countries take measures such as sanctions and other measures to push Israel to do that. So yes, it is a requirement and a responsibility it's to ensure that the orders, uh, provisional measures of the court um, are upheld and any final judgment is upheld as well. Do we have any recent precedent of a country that hasn't complied with the order by the International Court of Justice and as a result has been sanctioned? We haven't got, I I can't off the top of my head think of any specific situations where a sanction has been imposed that's directly related to the failure to comply with a judgment. We know that there have been failures to comply with judgments. A judgment of provisional measures in relation to Russia, for example, has not been complied with. Um, And we do know that there are ongoing Uh, sanctions in relation to Russia and Russian officials that have been imposed by the UK, the US, the EU, and so on and so forth. So whilst some of those measures may not specifically relate to the failure to comply, they do relate to the actions that that are form part of the provisional measures. So we have seen precedent for states taking action to stop states from taking measures that form part of a provisional judgment, um, uh, sorry, a provisional measure. At the moment, people seem not certain, but pretty optimistic that there will be a ruling in favour of South Africa's case for provisional measures being implemented. Where do you sit on this? I don't think there's any problem with people speaking about the merits of the case. I I, I have read uh, the South African 
uh, uh, application. Um, and certainly I watched the proceedings this morning and I will watch the proceedings tomorrow um, where Israel will present its case on provisional measures. Um, from Human Rights Watch's perspective, we have documented serious violations of international law and war crimes that have been committed both by Israel and Hamas in the context of the current hostilities. We have um, documented collective punishment of the Palestinian people, which is being carried out through the absolute blockade other than a trickle of aid going through. We know that Israel has also been use, using starvation as a weapon of war, a method of warfare. We have seen apparent war crimes being carried out by Israel targeting uh, mil, uh, medical facilities and medical uh, vehicles and so on and so forth. So certainly from Human Rights Watch's perspective, it is very, very clear that there are egregious violations of international law that have been carried out. Um, and certainly for, for, from where we stand, we will be waiting to see how the court assesses on the basis of the evidence, uh, the claims of genocide. But we as a human rights organisation have found that war crimes and serious violations of international law have been carried out. And we're certainly very happy that this uh, issue will get ventilated at the International Court of Justice and that we will have a decision both on provisional measures, which, as we've noted, relates to the protection of, of Palestinian people uh, right now, as well as a final judgment as to whether genocide has, in fact, been carried out by Israel. Some people have said that international law itself is actually on trial today. Uh, where do you stand on that statement? I can understand what people are saying in relation to that. This has been a significant moment for international law and the international rules-based order. Many people, including Human Rights Watch, have noted how the international community have responded in such different ways to situations, for example, in relation to Russia and Ukraine, uh, as compared to how the international community has responded to what we have seen happening in Gaza and in Israel. And certainly the, the fact that there has been this disparity undermines the integrity of the international rules-based order. This moment is very significant. This is the pinnacle international court for the United Nations. And this is a moment where international law is playing a central role in both protecting civilians and determining whether states have in fact committed some of the most egregious violations that can be committed. So I, I certainly can understand why people are saying that this is a moment to see whether the international rules-based order stands, has integrity, and whether states, and, and particularly whether states that have been the bastions of the international rules-based order, states like the US and the UK and Canada and others, whether they will apply that consistently and whether they will, in fact, uphold the integrity of the system or whether their interests and the interests of their allies will, in fact, trump that. And what we will see is, very, is, very, is a, you know, a significant undermining of what was built after the Second World War, what was built as a means to ensure that we never saw what we saw during the Holocaust and the atrocities that were committed then as well as obviously what happened after in, during the Second World War more generally. That was Yasmin Ahmed from Human Rights Watch speaking to me earlier today. Something that struck me is I, you know, listened to this case on Al Jazeera. Everyone I know listened to this case on Al Jazeera, but it didn't seem to be broadcast on any of the major news channels in the UK, at least not the rolling coverage that I saw on Al Jazeera and the like. Uh, Kieran, we've had Sky News on the office all day. Neither they nor the BBC seem to have aired large parts of this hearing. Is that a mistake on their parts? Are they missing out on history here? Well, it's not a mistake if your business is to create a cosy consensus for the state of Israel. Uh, by employing euphemisms for genocide or would-be genocide or attempted genocide, auto-correcting that wherever it appears in the public sphere to things like conflict and so on. If that's your business, then I say this isn't a mistake. Um, but it is a mistake if what you want to do is report the truth or report about significant things happening in the world, which this very, very clearly is for many of the reasons that your uh, previous speaker so articulately outlined. Um, I mean, this 
I'll just repeat the obvious, but let's remind ourselves, this is, a, this is not Etzelem, this is not PSC, this is not Amnesty International, this is a state taking another state to The Hague. It's very, very significant. And even if the unthinkable should happen, we're all horribly disappointed. And the court finds in favor of Israel, which I personally don't expect to happen. But even if that does happen, a Rubicon has been crossed here. Something very serious has happened. And I think it's going to send reverberations through the international legal system and the international political system as well. Oh, and your previous guest, you were right to ask her more about the rules-based order and whether international law itself is on trial. You know, that's not an uh, abstract or flippant thing to say. It very seriously describes how many people from the global south in particular, but also many populations all around the world, feel about the double standards immanent in international law. You know, it's not a new phenomenon that international law has uh, emboldened the mighty and the powerful, uh, but forced the weak to do what it must, to use the term of Thucydides. This is something that goes back all the way to ancient Greece. Now, if international law is serious about its norms dissemination, if it's serious about pushing back against the idea that the only thing that determines dynamics in the international political system is power, in other words, that might is right, then this is an absolutely pivotal moment for everybody who, who consider themselves proponents of that argument. I am personally, at this moment in time, thinking about my grandfather, who was shot in the head during Nakba, but miraculously survived. I'm thinking about the 10,000, barely say it, 10,000 children for whom the summer of 2023 was the last summer they'll ever know. I'm thinking about my friend who I spoke to yesterday from Gaza, who detailed for me how her 13-year-old brother was killed in December. A bomb exploded and, she, and he was running away from the bomb explosion, holding his father's hand. He gripped his father's hand intensely and then loosened his hand and he was gone. I'm thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, about every single Palestinian who has suffered under the yoke of Israeli oppression and humiliation and brutalization since 1948. Every single one of those individuals, all of those people were failed, failed by international law and by the rules-based international order. I don't want to believe that might is right and that the only thing that exists in the world is machtpolitik or realpolitik. But this is a, a moment in which, and I don't think it's too late, by the way, it's never too late. There's no, here's a legal term, statute of limitations on doing the right thing by a people. So I very much hope that that is the rubicon we're crossing. And I can certainly speak for my grandfather and I'm sure others in saying that were he here, he would be delighted to see that after three months of uh, indulgence in the most vile and horrifying violence against the entire peoples, Israel has been frog-marched to the Hague. That was an exceedingly uh, powerful bit of testimony there, Kieran. And I will say I have no idea whether this case will lead to Israel actually complying with anything. But at the very least, the absolute catharsis, as you say, of uh, Israel being marched to The Hague and being forced to confront what they have done in The Hague without being able to interrupt, without being able to shout people down, without being able to weaponize accusations of anti-Semitism against people, having to face what they have wrought upon the Palestinians in Gaza was exceedingly cathartic. And it is a crying shame that the UK media did not want to give it more attention. Now, South Africa's case uh, before the International Court of Justice is damning. Over the course of three hours, as we've said, lawyers for the country presented a litany of atrocities committed by Israel and Gaza. And the strength of South Africa's case has the Israeli government rattled, and not without reason. On the eve of the trial, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, posted this. I want to make a few points absolutely clear. 
Israel has no intention of permanently occupying Gaza or displacing its civilian population. Israel is fighting Hamas terrorists, not the Palestinian population. And we are doing so in full compliance with international law. That was far from the only piece of new public relations content that Israel has put out as the ICJ hearing gets underway. As South Africa began presenting their case, Israel's official X account posted this message from Israeli Defense Force spokesperson Daniel Hagari. We do security checks on humanitarian aid trucks for weapons before they enter Gaza. We have increased our screening capacity considerably. We have been screening aid trucks faster than aid organizations are able to get them into Gaza. Unfortunately, for weeks there have been long lines of humanitarian aid trucks sitting, waiting to get to the people of Gaza, who truly need this critical aid. We are trying to assist aid organizations with their distribution problems by holding daily meetings with key stakeholders to help them solve problems, provide expertise, and find practical solutions to the problems they face. We do this because our war is against Hamas, not against the people of Gaza. We recognize that aid distribution in a war zone is challenging, also for us, which is why we coordinate routes for aid trucks we coordinate daily humanitarian corridors and implement specific tactical pauses in our operations to support the aid distribution efforts. Martin Chris, the UN's humanitarian chief, disagrees with Hagari's claims that Israel is trying very hard to get aid into Gaza. On the 29th of December, he posted this. You think getting aid into Gaza is easy. Think again. Three layers of inspections before trucks can even enter. Confusion and long queues. A growing list of rejected items. A crossing point meant for pedestrians, not trucks. Another crossing point where trucks have been blocked by desperate, hungry communities. A destroyed commercial sector. Constant bombardments. Poor communications. Damaged roads. Convoys shot at. Delays at checkpoints. A traumatised and exhausted population crammed into a smaller and smaller sliver of land. Shelters which have long exceeded their full capacity. Aid workers themselves displaced, killed. This is an impossible situation for the people of Gaza and for those trying to help them. The fighting must stop. Well, other Israeli politicians have been quick to respond to the beginning of the ICJ hearing. Israeli's Minister for National Security, the far-right MP Itamar Ben-Gavir, said this. 78 years after the terrible Holocaust that the German Nazis inflicted on us and three months after the Nazis from Gaza added to the massacre of us, the world joins the theatre of the absurd and spreads blood plots against the state of Israel. We protect our citizens, our women, our children and spread lies and abomination against us in the world. Uh, never before have so many scoundrels joined such vile lies. Ben Gavir has more reason than most to try and discredit South Africa's case. That's because a major part of it involves showing that Israeli politicians, military leaders and officials intended to commit genocide against Palestinians. That aspect of the case is based largely on things they've said. Uh, like these words that came out of Ben Gavir's mouth in November and which are actually cited in South Africa's case. When we say Hamas should be destroyed, it also means those who celebrate, those who support, and those who hand out candy. They're all terrorists, and they should also be destroyed. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu has also responded to today's events at The Hague, saying this. Today we saw an upside-down world. Israel is accused of genocide, while it is fighting against genocide. The hypocrisy of South Africa screams to the heavens. Where were South Africa's when millions of people were killed or torn from their homes in Syria and Yemen by whom? By partners of Hamas. The US is sending them the finest of crack. Uh, Kieran, is Israel running scared from the ICJ case? Yes, uh, in short. Um, it speaks to the catharsis that you were talking about earlier, I think. It, it is running scared and it's running scared. It's, I'm afraid to say it, it's a... I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be uh, say something unfiltered. It's a society, unfortunately, that has driven itself mad. It's driven itself mad by appealing to the most right-wing elements. And I suppose that in itself inheres in the need to displace a population and then uh, impound them within a security state. Uh, as it's done that, it's, there's been a, a, an incentive for politicians in Israel to 
ensure that their rhetoric becomes further and further, uh, goes further and further to the right. Nonetheless, Israel is a state in the world. And so it has to play a two level game, to borrow a fairly dry American political scientist's uh, Robert Putnam's phrase. It has to play a two level game. It has to, or at least it had to, somehow seem as though it fitted into the comity of nations. It wanted to trade. It wanted to do tourism. It wanted to be integrated into the West. It wanted to be considered a liberal democracy. It wanted to have its beaches put on postcards and so on. But you can't, I'm afraid, have it both ways when the two things are so, when the two things become so polarized as they have in Israel because of the rightward turn in Israeli society. And and yet, because it's a political culture and to some extent the society has driven itself mad, it didn't realize that it was doing this. It didn't realize for a long time that it was totally alienating itself or isolating itself. I really believe that. I think it thought it could get away with this ad infinitum. Um, and there was now there seems to be this kind of Millwall-esque, everybody hates us and we don't care thing about it. Um, but the, the, the quotes, the clips that you've played demonstrate that it is... Um, scared, and also, you know, saying that the South African legal team is the legal arm of Hamas. I mean, that just wax of desperation. So the answer is yes. Yeah, Millwall. If Man City suddenly started sending them millions, billions every month and fielding them their best players for when they needed them, I think it's just fascinating watching Israeli officials rub up against reality outside their safe little bubble of yeses from uh, the Western international community. Suddenly they're getting a lot of no's. While South Africa addresses the international community on behalf of Palestine, the slaughter in Gaza continues. Only 15 of Gaza's 36 hospitals are still partially functioning. And in central Gaza, the only hospital still in operation is Al-Aqsa. But fears are growing that IDF troops are drawing closer to the hospital and that it too may find itself under attack. According to the World Health Organization, hundreds of medical staff and patients have had to leave Al-Aqsa. Just five doctors are thought to remain. They're responsible for at least 600 patients still needing treatment within the hospital, and hundreds of displaced people are also sheltering there. Even though hospitals are protected in conflicts under humanitarian law, Israel has shown little regard for this. In November 2023, Israel besieged Gaza's largest hospital, Al-Shifa, meaning hundreds of patients had to be evacuated. Those who couldn't be moved were left behind, and power cuts led to the deaths of multiple patients, including 43 ICU patients and eight premature babies. Al-Shifa is now attempting to resume operations at a medical centre, but with its facilities reduced to the most basic level and almost no staff. Last week, the World Health Organization's general director aired his fears about a similar fate befalling Al-Aqsa Hospital. Writing on X, he said this. The World Health Organization has received troubling reports of increasing hostilities and ongoing evacuation orders near the vital Al-Aqsa Hospital in the middle area of Gaza, which, according to the facility's director, forced over 600 patients and most health workers to leave. Their locations are not currently known. I'm joined now by Nick Maynard, a surgeon with medical aid for Palestinians who was pulled out of Al-Aqsa last week. Nick, what did you see in Al-Aqsa Hospital? I saw scenes the like of which I would never have expected to see in my medical career. And I've been practicing medicine for over 30 years. Um, and they were awful apocalyptic scenes, mass overcrowding, um, the... The, the, the normal capacity of Al-Aqsa Hospital is about 150 patients. It's a small hospital uh, in Gaza. Um, they had over 700 patients there for most of the two weeks I was working there. Um, so mass crowding, the minute you walk into the hospital, you can hardly move because every available space, the reception areas, the staircases, the wards, the recovery areas, the offices, the radiology department, full of patients, some of them in beds, many of them lying on the grounds. And the same was outside the hospital. A, a, a new a sort of a mini town had built up around the hospitals of people from the surrounding areas going there, seeking shelter, thinking it's going to be safer. So um, there were hundreds of makeshift tents outside um, made of tarpaulin, made of 
plastic, you name it. Uh, and the scenes were just awful. I've never seen anything like it. Now, an IDF spokesperson told the BBC yesterday there was no activity around Al-Aqsa Hospital. Is this true to the, what you experienced? I was operating there every day for two weeks or for 13 days, actually, because our visit was cut short. Last Friday, I was operating all day and um, on a very serious blast injury to the abdomen with severe internal damage. And it took me a few hours and I finished at about quarter to three and left the operating theatre to hear that the intensive care unit had sustained a missile attack. I saw it. um, There was a large hole in the wall of the um, intensive care unit. And there were strong rumours that there were snipers outside um, within the environment near the hospital um, shooting at people. And we certainly saw patients coming in with single gunshot wounds. Uh, The majority of the patients we saw, of course, were blast injuries from the bombs. And when you see the gunshot wounds, they're clearly being shot um, and not being bombed like that. So, listen, there was unequivocal damage to the hospital by a missile. Um, And I've heard from colleagues who've stayed there, close friends who are Gazan doctors, that there have been further attacks on the hospital by the Israeli Defence Force. Where else are people sheltering in central Gaza? What are conditions like in the shelters there? So there are three main camps uh, in central Gaza near, in Deir al-Bala, near the hospital, uh, Al-Maghazi camp, Nusrat and um, Barej camps. They have been systematically um, and indiscriminately bombed over the two weeks I was there, we saw multiple casualties, hundreds sometimes each day coming in from those camps. Um, no warnings given. Um, many, many children were killed, uh, severely damaged. We saw the most appalling injuries, the like of which I, 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 I they will be imprinted on my mind forever. Appalling burns on small children, um, or traumatic amputations of arms and legs on children and and adults. So the most appalling injuries, and these are people who are sheltering. They've already been displaced from northern Gaza. They've come down south. They're now being displaced again, those that survived, down towards Rafa. And, of course, beyond Rafa is Egypt. Um, So there there are less and less places for these people to go. Rafa is a small town in southern Gaza. It has a population normally of 250,000, and currently there are 1.5 million people there and many, many thousands travelling towards Rafa as they're being evacuated for middle Gaza. So uh, there is nowhere else for them to go. After your experience in central Gaza and Al-Aqsa, what do you think British politicians like Rishi Sunak and David Cameron should be lobbying for in this conflict? Uh, that's a very easy question to answer, a ceasefire, a full, unequivocal ceasefire. And it, it is, uh, in, it, it's, in the true sense of the word incredible, it is incredible that our politicians are not calling for that. Um, it is, it, the whole of the nation of Gaza is being eradicated at the moment. Um, th- there. No, I've seen photo. I wasn't allowed to go into northern Gaza. We were not given security clearance, but we've all seen photos of nor- northern Gaza. It is, uh, it, it, it's, it's been completely and utterly destroyed. Um, you mentioned in your in the, your introduction that in the previous uh, presentation that there are some doctors left at Shifa. Well, I've, I've my colleagues have in, in Gaza have been in touch with them. They are providing first aid and nothing more than that. So there is there is literally nowhere else for them to go, and I think that the 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 healthcare structure, and the whole infrastructure of the healthcare stru- uh, system, is being systematically destroyed in Gaza. Beyond that immediate ceasefire, if that is achieved, what do healthcare workers need in the first instance to save lives in Gaza right now? Well, they need a huge amount of aid, uh, and there is aid going in, um, but the aid will be largely ineffective until there's a ceasefire. Uh, and, you know, as I've said, there must be a ceasefire. There, there could be no other way to tackle this humanitarian catastrophe. Um, the, the, we, when, we, when we came in through Rafa, on the approach to Rafa, through 
the northern Sinai and as you get towards Rafa and the border, there were miles upon miles of aid trucks queuing up, waiting to go in, some of them waiting for three, four, five days. Um, uh, uh, so there's no lack of aid trying to get in. They're just not being allowed in or they're being allowed in very, very slowly. We saw many trucks being turned away and going back, not having been denied entry into, into Gaza. And although it's across the Egyptian border, it is, of course, completely controlled by the Israeli Defence Force. They are in charge of what's going in. And there's not enough going in. I'm sure you've heard this statistic that in quieter times in Gaza, over 500 trucks of, of resources, medical supplies, food, water goes in every day. Um, the, the amount that's going in, although welcome, is wholly inadequate to, um, to, 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 to support the healthcare system there. And nothing will make any difference until there's a complete and unequivocal ce- ceasefire. Soli One says, I'm really glad that Navarro is covering the war in depth as opposed to our mainstream media. Thank you very much. If you want to support our work, remember you can go to navaramedia.com slash support. Navarra.media slash support. That's the correct link. Um, and give us just from one pound a month to become a regular supporter of Navarra Media. We're not backed by billionaires and we've got a huge year coming up. So we really do appreciate every little penny. Just when you think the post office horizon scandal couldn't get any worse, it does. We already know that the post office knowingly pursued some 900 innocent sub postmasters through the courts, sending many to jail while bankrupting others. And we know that hundreds of lives were ruined by their baseless claims. But now the Telegraph has reported this. Post office investigators were paid bonuses for every conviction of sub postmasters that they made. Just to remind you, in many cases, post office investigators knowingly withheld from the courts the fact that the Horizon software used in the branches was prone to errors. And now it looks like they had a financial reason to do so. The Telegraph reports this. Investigators with the post office described the incentive scheme as, quote, part of the business, with everyone in the security team, quote, on a bonus. Gary Thomas, who worked in the post office security team between 2000 and 2012, told the post office Horizon Inquiry that the bonus targets affected how he went about his work. Mr. Thomas branded all sub postmasters, quote, crooks in emails concerning one victim who was posthumously cleared. I just want to remind you of what the post office did to people's lives. Former postmaster Parmad Kalia has told his story to GMB saying this. When the auditors came and they said there was a different, a shortage of uh, 22,000, um, they said they wanted to interview me. They gave me an option that either I could have a family member, a solicitor, or a federation rep to be present. I hadn't done anything wrong. I didn't call a solicitor. I called the federation rep, and their response to me over the telephone was, "How quickly can you put that right to keep it out of the courts?" I didn't want to go to courts, I didn't want to go to jail, I didn't want to go to prison, I hadn't done anything wrong. I borrowed the money from my mum, her life savings, and gave it to the post office within two days. And despite that, when I still got letters to prosecute me, I phoned the Federation rep again, and I was told by the Federation rep, make up a story and plead guilty, and you will then maybe not get a custodial sentence, but maybe get a small sentence like a community order. It's just appalling. But you did end up getting a custodial sentence. I I, I did. I pleaded guilty, uh, like he said, on his advice. I got a six-month custodial sentence, of which I served three months inside and three on tag. The thought of you spending three months in prison is just so... It's absolutely shocking. It had an an awful impact on your family relationships, didn't it, as well? Very much so. Um, When I came out of prison in 2002, after the three months, I I was restricted as to what I could do with my shop. I couldn't go there. I couldn't leave the house before nine in the morning. I had to be back by six in the evening. Um, I, following the repercussions from the customers, I left the shop, basically, and let my wife and my children run that shop. Um, I started doing other things like minicabbing. Um, the impact it's had, we had to eventually close the shop, couldn't sell it. We just closed the shop down, lost all the goodwill of the shop, which we'd built up over the years. Mm. Um, and then I was 
completely in myself. It wasn't discussed, this aspect. It wasn't talked about. I had nobody, no other postmasters to talk to until 2015. For 15 years, oh. I cooked it up. All of this, all of it, went on right under the noses of successive governments, including the current one. For the excuses that some Conservatives are making right now, can we take a look at this clip from Peston, featuring private eye editor Ian Hislop and Tory MP Jake Berry. They were incentivised to make money for the post office. And that led to ignoring what was going on in the hope of getting better remuneration. And that's disgraceful. <laughs> and all of them should have to pay those bonuses back. 100%. But, I mean, but the problem we got in this country, and it's a serious problem, is no government has actually put in place any kind of system that actually enables clawback in these kind of circumstances. And in the end, you know, you're sort of relying on the goodwill of people to hand back money. Well, that's, when has that well, ever happened? One thing we well, do control is their massive taxpayer-funded pensions. We do have control of that, and we can pass an emergency piece of legislation, a parliamentary pardon. Why can't we do the same thing with their pension? Well, why couldn't you do it so long ago? The fact that it takes an ITV drama, and suddenly, having been told their entire campaigning lives, this is very difficult, you'll have to go in front of a judge, this is very, very expensive, oh, this morning it isn't, tomorrow we'll pass legislation and you're all exonerated. I mean, it is absolutely fatuous <laughs> for this government to claim, hey, we're really acting now. Did nothing. Did nothing oh, no, sorry, the whole sorry, time. Okay. Sorry. That no, you're is, not sorry. That is demonstrably... Not sorry. That is demonstrably complete and utter... Why did you give her a CBE that, in 2019? Why did you, a why did you appoint you her to the Cabinet elite, Office? You talk her over dogs. everyone else and you've been doing it the entire programme. Shh, Ian, Ian, let him speak. <laughs> Two wrongs don't make that it right. That programme, <laughs> which you claim to love so much and was an amazing piece of drama put together by... What, ITV, you're saying I don't ends, like her? Ends, why am I claiming to love that programme? Ends. I did like that programme. You can't just talk nonsense and not it's be not interrupted. It's <laughs> Ian Hislop, furious there. I mean, he's the editor of Private Eye, which was one of the first uh, pieces of uh, journalism media in this country to actually blow the whistle on the post office scandal. It was picked up later by other um, media outlets, but the government turned a blind eye again and again and again. And that is because they're pursuing the same policy they pursued for a very long time. Until a big enough public outrage is made, nothing will happen. And it really did take an ITV drama in order for them to take any action on this. And suddenly, yes, we can overturn these convictions, these wrongful convictions. You don't have to go through the courts again. It's a similar policy that was done at a microcosm at the Home Office, which is when people were wrongly refused, you know, visas, asylum claims, etc. Then only when a larger stink was made. I remember one journalist in particular who was refused the right to uh, permanent residency and she lived here for so long, only because she was a journalist, only because she had the right connections. She complained. She got a lot of traction for her case. The Home Office got in touch. And later, BuzzFeed News did a big uh, investigation into that policy. And it turned out if you had enough traction, enough social capital, and you made enough of a stink, the Home Office would overturn your case, creating this hierarchy where only people who were connected enough could actually get justice from the hostile environment. And it's the same thing here. Only, only when, the, when the ITV drama was made only when the majority of the country could see all the details of this case in granular detail, by the way. Uh, only then was there enough outrage garnered. And that is why we were not going to get justice for Grenfell and we're not going to get justice for the other people who live in all those poorly clad, flammable properties that are now useless until a, a drama is made on ITV, Channel 4 or the BBC. So I hope, I hope that's in production now. Um, of the hundreds of postmasters prosecuted also, almost 40% of them were from minority ethnic background. And I'm glad we're talking about this finally because I wanted to cover this several years ago at a small outlet that I worked for and we didn't have enough resources. We tried to ring this bell. Even us back in 2020 could see that there was a racial element to this. And if alarm bells are now ringing, that's because they should be. And several former postmasters have now described how racism played a role in their treatment by the post office. The BBC reports this. One man from an Indian background said a member of post office staff told him all the Indians are doing it. They have relatives, so they take the money and send it to them abroad. Another person of South Asian descent said, it was like we were dumb because English wasn't our first language, that we struggled to make sense of basic accounting. Another said of the post office staff he dealt with, quote, it felt like they thought you were foreigner and you'd robbed them. 
Another former postmaster, Balvinder Gill, was wrongly accused of stealing £108,000 in 2004. The case against him led to a breakdown and he was sectioned three times. But his mother, Kashmir, was also convicted of stealing £54,000 in 2009. Her conviction was overturned in 2021. Gill told the BBC this. My parents are spoken to as if they were idiots because they're not white. They were made to feel like they didn't understand the system and that they were stupid. I know from my parents' experience that whenever they try to explain something because their English was broken, they were normally just shut down and I'm certain that was because of their colour. I guess when you're after a bonus, your success rate goes up if you target people who might be less well-placed to defend themselves. Stephen Bradshaw, one of the post office's investigators, has appeared at the post office inquiry. One of the postmasters he pursued described Bradshaw and other investigators of, quote, behaving like mafia gangsters. He denied this. But the inquiry heard that Bradshaw had been repeatedly told that there were problems with the Horizon accounting system. And yet... Bradshaw revealed he continued his investigations into postmasters anyway because nothing had been, quote, cascaded down from the top. Kieran, I've really been waiting for this ethnicity element to be brought up. And something I find very striking is, one, there's a disproportionate um, representation of South Asian families in uh, sub-postmastery anyway, if that's even a phrase. Uh, what I found really interesting was these were middle-class South Asian families who'd kind of been sold the British dream, like if you come here and you can get on, you can become part of our middle class. But when it came down to it, the state still turned on them really disproportionately as well. What do you make of that? Well, what I make of it is that it doesn't matter if you're middle class. It doesn't matter really if you're middle class, so long as you uh, unfortunately have, uh, quote unquote, the wrong skin colour in the eyes of these people. And our, our society is coded in such a racialized way still. Our institutions are loaded with racialized toxins, mm. racial, racist toxins, such that you know, any attempts to flush them out of our institutions meet a great deal of resistance through path dependence and whatever else. There are these legacies of, of empire and they're going to be long with us and they take continual, it takes continual efforts to rid ourselves of them. I confess that I've been very consumed with the, the case in, um, in The Hague and I haven't followed this as closely as I probably should have, but I do want to draw out a single parallel. I talk, we talked earlier about international law and it not being taken seriously by the people who profess to, um, to be in charge of it and who are the highest proponents of it. Well, again, here, as you pointed out, Moya, and as in his lot, not usually a huge fan, but good on him, pointed out, it took, you know, an ITV drama and whatever else for the law to begin to take this seriously. The political class wants us to take these things seriously, law, just as the international political class wants us to take international law seriously. The striking thing is they ought to start taking it a bit more seriously themselves if they want the public to invest any kind of um, faith in it and start acting in accordance with that faith. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think what was also striking about that ITV drama is it did actually put a uh, white middle class post sub postmaster as its key protagonist. Um, just another element of erasure within this entire thing. How do you make people care? It's a question I'm constantly thinking about. How do you make people care? Maybe, maybe something we can discuss another day. Anyway, thank you so much, Kieran, for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. We'll be back tomorrow. If you've been moved by anything you've seen today, remember there is another national march for a ceasefire uh, on Saturday, starting at 12 noon in London. There are also marches going on all over the country. But for now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night. Good night.